Hello students, welcome to lecture 33 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's lecture will be on webcast splitters, nonlinear filters and biostability. So here is the lecture outline, we will have a brief interaction to the topic, we will analyze a webcast splitter using the temporal couple mode theory. We will also discuss about nonlinear filters, optical biostability and then finally conclude this lecture. So, we have already seen the analysis of two devices using temporal coupled mode theory. In the previous lecture, one was a filter, another was uh, one was a sharp waveguide band. So, here in this particular lecture, we will look into another important waveguide device which is a splitter. Now, what does the splitter do? It divides the power in an input waveguide equally between the two output waveguides. So, like the band, the photonic band gap here also eliminates the radiation loss and we need to only deal with the possibility of reflection. So, unlike the band, it turns out that we cannot eliminate reflection by a symmetry argument and we must do something counterintuitive. So, here we need to obstruct the output waveguides in order to increase transmission. So, before we go into the details, let us uh, recall the basic formulae that have been used in the temporal couple mode analysis in the previous lecture. So, the first one was the differential equation for cavity amplitude A. So, d a by d t was given as minus i omega naught a minus a by tau 1 minus a by tau 2 plus alpha 1 s 1 plus plus alpha 2 s 2 plus and that was equation 1. We have already seen the relation for waveguide modes. Okay? So, how um, the outgoing and the incoming waves in the waveguide modes they are related. Okay? So, S L minus was given as beta L S L plus plus gamma L A. L represents 1 or 2 that tells you whether it is waveguide 1 or waveguide 2. And the final equation was this if you remember that was our equation 3. So, d A by d T was basically minus I omega naught A minus summation over L equals 1 to 2 A by tau L plus same semi summation over L equals 1 to 2 square root of 2 by tau L S L plus. Okay? And you can write this in terms of the parameters here. So, S L minus will be equal to minus S L plus plus square root of 2 by tau L A. Okay? The, so, these are the four important equations. Okay? So, just to give you a brief, what is A? A was basically the variable that determines the electric and magnetic field amplitudes in the cavity. Okay. SL plus are the incoming waves or incoming modes. SL minus represent the outgoing waveguide modes for the waveguides. Tau is basically the mode lifetime. Alpha L and gamma L they basically represent the strength of the cavity to waveguide coupling. And beta L is basically the reflection coefficient at each waveguide. Okay? And another term is also there that is omega naught that is basically the resonant frequency. So, with all these basics, if you have any doubt on this particular thing, so you can go back and revisit lecture 32 that will give you a better understanding of all these equations, how they are obtained and what are they doing. Now, with that, understanding let us analyze waveguide splitter. So, an example of a T shaped uh, splitter structure which is basically formed by uh, missing rods in a photonic crystal waveguide that is shown in this particular figure. Okay? So, here you see the E z field distribution is shown for this T splitter. So, this is input, this is output port uh, 3 and out, this is output port 2. So, this is port 1, port 2 and port 3. This is how they numbered it. Okay? So, what is expected here that uh, you should get 100 percent transmission that is 50-50 from each 
of your uh, output modes and that happens when uh, omega a by 2 pi c equals 0 0.4 ok. So, this is the exact structure and this is the abstract model using the temporal couple mode theory. So, here you have uh, one um, incoming waveguide that is waveguide 1 and 2 output ports ok. But then uh, the incoming and output uh, outgoing waveguide modes are identified in the same fashion S1 plus S1 minus then you have S2 plus ok S2 minus ok this is the cavity these are the decay constant tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 ok and so on. So, this is a generic formula. So, here to get 100 percent transmission we cannot use a symmetric junction and we must insert rods something like white rods that you see over here. These are basically white rods of uh, permittivity epsilon equals 3.5 ok and that could obstruct, uh, obstruct the output waveguides ok and that basically improves the transmission. So, some, some extra thing that I have to do to basically get that 100 percent transmission and that was the one I mentioned about the counter intuitive thing ok. Now, what you see here that this is basically becoming a three port system. So, the coupled mode equation that you have seen that equation number 3 needs to be modified and then that typically becomes like this. So, now the equation will look like d a by d t equals minus i omega naught a minus summation over l equals 1 to 3 ok a over tau l plus summation over l equals 1 to 3 square root 2 by tau l s l plus. So, only thing that has changed is l equals 1 to 3 because it is now a 3 port system. Now, in this abstract model another important parameter is that you will be getting 100 percent transmission when you have 1 over tau 1 should be becoming equal to 1 over tau 2 plus 1 over tau 3. So, this is the incoming input port you can say these are the two output ports. Now, using the equations 5 and 4 ok where you can put some um, because there are no uh, waves which are basically incident from uh, waveguide 2 and waveguide 3. So, you can write S 2 plus and S 3 plus both can be 0. So, you can put that into this equation and then you can solve for the reflection and transmission spectra like before and that will give you r of omega that is the reflection reflectance as a function of frequency. You can represent it as square root of s 1 minus whole square divided by s 1 plus whole square and this is how the equation looks like. So, this is giving you the estimate of the power getting reflected back to waveguide 1. So, this is our equation 6. Now, how much is the transmission happening to from 1 to 2 ok. So, that you can represent as t 1 to 2 and that is also function of frequency. So, the formula will be s 2 minus modulus whole square divided by s 1 plus modulus whole square and this is how the expression looks like it is 4 by t 1 t 2 sorry tau 1 tau 2. So, here you see and in the uh, denominator you have omega minus omega naught whole square plus this term ok 1 over tau 1 plus 1 over tau 2 plus 1 over tau 3 whole square. So, the transmission will have a peak when omega equals omega naught. For transmission into waveguide 3 the same equation can be written just you replace 2 by 3 ok. So, this denominator remains same just that in the numerator tau 2 will be now replaced by tau 3 and this is how the equation looks like. So, with this you can estimate the transmission happening to waveguide port 2 and port 3. So, from this equation 6 ok it is clear that zero reflection can happen when you have this to be matched. So, omega equals omega naught and also there is another term that is when your omega 1 by uh, tau 1 will be equal to 1 by tau 2 plus 1 by tau 3. Okay. So, from equation 6 you can also see that it is possible to get the 0 reflection 
when omega equals omega naught and uh, to ensure 100 percent transmission from waveguide 1 to the waveguides 2 and 3 okay you have to also meet this particular condition that 1 by tau 1 should be equal to 1 by tau 2 plus 1 by tau 3. So, if you meet this condition you can go back here you will see you will basically get complete 0 reflection okay? and 100 percent uh, power will be transmitted from waveguide 1 to uh, waveguide 2 and 3 and they will get equally split. Okay? So, this particular relation 1 by tau 1 equals 1 by tau 2 plus 1 by tau 3 is a very interesting relation for two reasons. First, it can never be satisfied at a 120 degree rationally uh, rotationally symmetric junction okay, where you can that if you make it 120 degree rotationally symmetric junction okay, means this, this one goes here and this one looks like this. Okay. In that case 1 by tau 1 will be equal to 1 by tau 2 equal to 1 by tau 3. So, you can, can never make this one happen. Okay. And secondly, we cannot uh, satisfy equation 9 purely by symmetry, um, then you must uh, force it manually. Okay. So, you have to do some extraordinary things to get that. So, here what has been done in the case of figure 1, you can actually uh, accomplish this obstruction by adding a single rod okay, that you can see in white okay, in uh, each of the out output waveguide. So, just in the beginning of each of this output waveguide, you add the single rod and that helps you to achieve that extraordinary fit. Okay. Since we cannot uh, satisfy that equation 9 a priori, we must adjust the length of this obstruction okay, or by varying the radius or the permittivity of this rod until through numerical simulation you can see that you are actually achieving the uh, highest transmission or maximum transmission at a desired frequency for the structure. So, this is some, some kind of tuning you have to do um, on top of the regular thing okay? so, to get that uh, splitter works. Now, we move on to the next topic which is nonlinear filters. So, first let us look into some basics of nonlinear optics. So, to understand what is nonlinear, first let us look into what is linear. Okay. So, a linear system basically exhibits a response that is directly proportional to the external influences. So, if there are multiple influences like such as F1, F2 and up to Fj, they are applied simultaneously. Okay. The overall responses will be the sum of responses as if uh, each are applied independently. So, that is basically the superposition principle. Now, what will be then the definition and characteristics of nonlinear system? So, if you think in contrast to the linear system, a nonlinear system's response is not strictly proportional to the applied influences, and the interactions between the influences can lead to energy transfer among them. And this is evident in the behavior of certain materials under electromagnetic fields. So, in this context, nonlinear optics is basically those phenomena where the response of a material to applied electric field becomes nonlinear. That means the material basically alters the field through mechanisms such as polarization, and this can include a variety of behaviors uh, depending on the intensity and the nature of the electric field. So, that can give rise to nonlinear photonic crystals as well. So, the periodic structure where the optical response varies with the intensity of the optical field. Okay. So, here the intensity that is mean that means the square of the electric field right? that offers uh, enhanced functionalities which are typically not possible by the uh, linear photonic crystal. So, linear photonic crystal is where 
the property varies with the amplitude of the electric field. But here in nonlinear photonic crystal, the optical responses varies with the amplitude square or the intensity of the electric uh, of the optical field. So, some examples of tunability will include uh, optical control through external uh, fields, temperature induced uh, refractive index changes, intrinsic material nonlinearities for first response in advanced uh, communication systems. What are the characteristics of this nonlinear crystals? First is the nonlinearity, that means their refractive index can change with light intensity which is very crucial and critical for nonlinear optical responses okay? and the periodicity okay? that means the regular repeating lattice structure which are crucial for structure element of the atoms and lastly optical anisotropy that means you can have varying refractive index or refractive indices along different axes of the crystal. Okay. So, the propagation of electromagnetic wave in a medium is typically described by the Maxwell's equation. The electric displacement that is capital D and the electric field E are connected by a, the by the constitutive relation of the material that is where the epsilon r which is the relative permittivity uh, okay, that comes into the picture. So, if you consider a homogeneous anisotropic medium, this, this permittivity is basically a tensor and the relationship of the displacement field and the electric field can be written like this. So, d i will be epsilon naught which is the vacuum permittivity times epsilon r i j. So, this is the relative permittivity which is the tensor and then it, it depends on e j. Okay? So, that way you can actually calculate what is the electric displacement in a particular direction. So, the dielectric constant of the medium can be written as 1 plus chi i j. Okay? So, chi is basically the electric susceptibility and refractive index n i j is nothing but the real part of this uh, 1 plus chi i j which is the permittivity. So, real part of the complex permittivity okay, can help you or uh, this is the first order. So, that can help you find the refractive index tensor as well. So, that as I mentioned, so this chi i j 1 represents the first order nonlinear susceptibility. So, the real part of it gives you the refractive index okay, and the imaginary part will describe the loss in the medium. So, epsilon r i j can be written as 1 plus chi i. Okay, one. So, when the material is strongly disturbed, the linear approximation which considers independent of electric field is no longer valid. So, in that case the relation between the volume polarization P or the displacement D and the electric field E also stays no longer linear. So, you can write the polarization P in terms of you know <coughs> the different components electric field components and the expression typically looks like this p i equals epsilon naught chi i j first order e j plus chi i j k that is the second word of term. So, you have e j and e k and then you have the third order term and so on. So, when you actually see nonlinear effect in photonic crystal, okay, you have to understand this different nonlinear phenomena something like the Kerr like third order susceptibility. Okay? So, this is the first order, second order and this is the third order susceptibility. Okay? Then other phenomena something like two photon absorption, negative refraction, optical memory and light storage all these things will come because of the nonlinear effects in photonic crystal. Now, in optical realm and uh, specifically for 2D photonic crystals, various methods have been proposed for applying tuning abilities and controlling the properties of the desired devices. However, the approaches used so far basically suffer from lot of 
uh, disadvantages okay we can see some of the tuning methods one is thermo optic method so they are basically used in 2d photon crystal switches their disadvantage is that they exhibit switching speeds in the order of microsecond which may not meet the requirement for ultra fast applications the second one is electro optic techniques here the application is are the reported cases in various studies for first switching okay here also the limitation is that the required voltage for operation can limit the overall operating speed of the device you can also have directional coupler based structures so what are the issues here they have large coupling length which lead to higher consumption of optical power and may become impractical for compact device design thus there are some benefits coming from non-linear optical processes first thing would be the ultra fast response so non-linear effects could demonstrate response times of the order of 10 picoseconds which are typically suitable for ultra fast optical applications so strong non-radiative recombination of photocarriers at etched holes can contribute to fast responses and that becomes the mechanism for this kind of uh, ultra fast response and the carrier induced non-linear index changes can rapidly shift the wavelength of a photonic crystal resonance and that is how you can get the tuning now let us discuss about an add drop filter so in an add drop filter there will be a ring okay and this ring and the cavity resonator what is the function of that i believe all of you have seen this before the ring resonator or the add drop filter okay in this particular course as well so they are basically designed to trap light which propagates in a circular closed path okay enhancing the non-linear optical effects then you can think of constructive interference of light allows it to so constructive interference with itself after every round trip and that is how you can actually get a you know standing wave formation right so this process creates a standing wave pattern and that intensifies the optical field within the resonator and this will lead up to intensity build up as well the repeated circulation of the light coherently builds up the light's intensity inside the resonator to levels exceeding the incident uh, optical power okay so that is how we will be able to see the CAD like nonlinear full optical add drop filter okay so this will lead to enhancement in the nonlinear effects as as i mentioned this significantly increase in intensity will facilitate a strong ac care effect enhancing the nonlinear response of the resonator to the incoming light the total polarization due to the second and the third order nonlinearities can be given as px equals epsilon naught one plus chi first order times e x plus chi 2 that is the second order term e x dot e x ok so that is where it becomes the square ok e x square and then you have chi 3 that is e modulus e x square dot e x ok so that way you are able to see the nonlinear effect coming here and n l square yeah that is the correct formula n l square will be equal to uh, epsilon l equals 1 plus chi 1 that is the dielectric constant so this is where i was also uh, noticing the typo can you just go back here yeah so this is this this one is correct but not this equation okay so i'll upload it later uh, when i upload the slides because ideally uh, 1 plus susceptibility gives you the permittivity and uh, if if the permittivity is complex so okay it will have say epsilon uh, prime so it will have epsilon prime and epsilon double prime that is the real and the imaginary part and those two can be related to the real and the imaginary part of the refractive indices as well 
okay so this this equation does not look correct to me i'll just cross check they it has been taken from this particular uh, paper okay so we'll just look into this there may be some typo by the authors over there so discard disregard this particular equation you go with this one okay this is the correct equation so ideally it should be like this that nl square that is the refractive index square will be equal to the permittivity okay so this is typically when your permittivity is real so if it is complex as i mentioned the equations will slightly vary so here chi 2 and chi 3 are basically the second and third order uh, nonlinear susceptibilities and at a single frequency of omega only the cubic nonlinearity that is the care effect this one is associated with the oscillating part of the polarization so that is to be found as this so you can write p n l the nonlinear will be equal to 3 by 8 epsilon naught chi cube or chi 3 okay and then you can write modulus e naught square times e naught okay and then you have e to the power minus i omega t x cap so what are the self consistency condition for the resonators this can be achieved when uh, the total optical phase shift after a full resonator round trip will be equal to the integral multiple of 2 pi and this condition restricts resonance to only those specific optical frequencies okay which meet this condition and that will allow the light at those frequencies to be effectively utilized so how to integrate this with the wave guiding structures so the ring and the cavity resonator are combined with the conventional uh, wave guiding such as w1 line defect wave guides in photonic crystal and they can be used to create various optical devices so this is a typical uh, optical ring re resonator based uh, device okay so this is a single ring so there are devices with the double rings also over here okay so this single ring is placed in between two uh, parallel waveguides and as you can see so this is how the mode is traveling the ring can couple something over here and then it can uh, couple back to this particular waveguide and some will be so dropped from this particular Webcam. So, what happens here from this uh, you can actually make it as a add drop filter right. So, this basically works as a building block for many optical devices something like switches, logic gates, optical limiters, analog to digital converters and so on and the functionality in the nonlinear regime is basically influenced by the field intensity within the resonating modes that affects the round trip phase shift okay because the round trip phase shift plays a very important role which frequency will be contained in this resonating cavity and then only it will get coupled to this particular waveguide okay so the amount of nonlinear dependent refractive index that change due to the applied electric field can be given as this so delta nl can be written as 3 chi 3 over for z naught nl modulus of e naught square and that can be written as n2 i okay you can go and look into this particular reference paper for more details on this structure okay so here z naught is basically the free space uh, impedance n2 is is the nonlinear refractive index which is expressed in terms of the intensity okay so here is a filter design so in this filter it combines a single ring resonator with two parallel uh, line defect waveguides that creates a backward add drop filter so here you can see this is the input port this is the through port and this is the drop port and this this is showing the ring so these are basically all defect okay introduced in a otherwise uniform uni uh, photonic crystal so this can be used to tune the resonant wavelength of the ring resonator to a specific target so here you can consider operational uh, wavelength to be 1550 in free space okay so what you can do you can modify the size of the photonic nanocrystal rods in the ring okay to change its linear refractive index 
to n equals 1.2 and that will basically ensure that the transmission and the drop peaks at precisely that location of 1550 okay so here you can see you are getting the so this is p3 okay you are getting very sharp transmission at p3 okay and this is the input line so p1 you see p1 is a sharp drop over here at 1550 so all these things can be tuned by changing the diameter of the rods and the way you are introducing the defect in the crystal so this is basically it at the third telecom window that is in c band and uh, these silicon nanocrystals they basically demonstrate very strong nonlinear properties and that is good because the silicon nanocrystals uh, characteristic then strongly depend on the applied field intensity okay and by properly applying the required intensity the real and imaginary part of the silicon crystals refractive index can be changed non-linearly and the change in the real part is uh, described by the ac care effect and if you look for n2 that is basically the imaginary part is described by beta okay and the real part of the third order nonlinear susceptibility chi 3 okay uh, there n2 is higher than its uh, imaginary part that is you know beta okay so n2 is basically higher than beta by two orders of magnitude thus the most refractive index change is happening mainly due to the real part and if you want to enhance the quality factor okay what you can do you can actually align another ring over here vertically so if you have more rings vertically aligned and then you bring your final waveguide so in this case basically you have this is your input waveguide this is the first ring then you have to put another ring below another ring below and then you can actually put your um, final output waveguide and that will also give you a higher quality factor resonance now we move on to the next topic which is optical bistability so as the name says optical bistability there are two stable states right so bi means two stability okay so it refers to the nonlinear relation between the output and the input power in a filter with a nonlinear cavity so you can see the example here in um, figure 5 so in linear device where the output is always a linear function of uh, the input power here you can see that there is some instability in the middle branch so this is basically shown as the dashed curve of this s or you can say dashed branch of this s curve okay so that that causes the power to follow either a upper or lower stable branch so from here if you further increase the input power it will go here okay and then if you are already here and then you have you are reducing the power after you have come here it will not come this way okay it will jump from here to here and then it will follow like this okay so you are actually getting discontinuous jump so power jumps discontinuously between branches when reaching the end of a stable branch so this branch this is the end of the stable branch this is also the end of the stable branch and this is where it will jump so there is a dependence on the historical power values right it depends which way you know earlier power value was okay so if you are here you will be coming here but if you are here and you further reduce it you come down okay your output power drastically drops so the output power basically depends on its historical values okay so it follows the lower branch when starting from low power and it will follow the upper, up, upper branch when you are starting from the high power right so you are also able to see um, examples of uh, hysteresis effect in the power output response so in this case what are the initial conditions so first you need a cavity that has a resonance at uh, frequency omega naught and then you have in the input power 
that which is introduced at a frequency omega which is slightly below omega naught okay now you increase the power so in the in the linear regime the output power will be directionally directly proportional to the input power and as the input power increases the nonlinearity in the cavity will cause the permittivity epsilon to increase and that will shift your omega naught to lower frequencies and this shift moves the resonance peak down okay um, through the input frequency omega which affects the transmission so there are some feedback effects here so positive feedback something like you know there are enhanced coupling to the cavity as the system approaches resonance that leads to a sharper transition to higher transmission then that can be called as on transition okay there are also negative feedback that means reduced coupling as the system moves away from the resonance this results in a delayed transition to low transmission okay so that can be denoted as off transition clear so if you think of a filter configuration we can again think of this particular uh, setup or model of the temporal couple mode theory that you have seen in the previous lecture right so this is basically the setup for a waveguide cavity waveguide kind of uh, structure okay so here if you include the can nonlinearity okay so you can introduce the can nonlinearity where the dielectric constant epsilon is basically proportional to the square of the electric field's magnitude that is modulus of e square if you i hope you remember this this is the abstract diagram that shows the essential features of this model that means you have a single mode uh, input waveguide 1 okay where the input and the output field amplitudes are marked as s1 plus and s1 minus then you have this single mode output waveguide 2 where the input and the output are marked as s2 plus and s2 minus then you have a single resonant mode of field amplitude a and frequency omega naught and that is basically coupled to waveguides 1 and 2 with lifetimes of tau 1 and tau 2 and remember in the first case we have considered tau 1 and tau 2 to be similar because they are symmetrical waveguides okay now sl plus l is like 1 or 2 so sl plus are normalized so that modulus sl plus minus whole square is the power in the waveguide and the amplitude a of the resonant cavity is normalized so that modulus of a square is basically the energy of the cavity so this was the setup abstract diagram that we used for describing the filters now here how do you work on the localization of the nonlinear effects so nonlinear effects are most significant in the cavity because in the cavity the field is highest okay so as we understand that because of the nonlinearity there will be shift in resonance okay so the increase in permittivity within the cavity leads to a frequency shift that is delta omega naught okay in the cavity mode and that is proportional to modulus a square where a is basically the amplitude so when you take uh, modulus a square that is the intensity so proportional to that there is a shift in the resonance that is delta omega naught the can nonlinearity enables coupling between different uh, frequencies potentially causing uh, the third harmonic generation that means it converts from frequency omega to 3 omega and the primary nonlinear effect in the system will be the shift in the resonance frequency omega naught and uh, the third harmonic generation that is generation of frequency component 3 omega also becomes relevant if there is any resonant mode present at 3 omega naught so this type of nonlinear transmission allows us to create an all optical transistor by adding or removing power from the input waveguide you can switch from a low transmission to a high transmission state and vice versa 
So, everything that can be done with the electronic transistor can be thus as accomplished with our optical device as well. So, we can have switching, we can have logic gates, signal rectification, amplification and many other functions. So, with that we will try to conclude our findings. So, first we have seen the waveguide splitter using temporal coupled mode theory. We have understood that this utilizes the principle of temporal coupled mode theory to effectively manage light propagation and distribution within the waveguide system. It employs constructive interference and resonance conditions to maximize transmission efficiency and minimize loss and it can dynamically adjust to the changes in the light intensity that enables flexible optical routing and switching. Next we understood a drop filter using nonlinear photonic crystals. So, here it combines the nonlinear photonic crystals with conventional waveguide structures for enhanced filtering capabilities. This kind of devices exploits the CAR effect, the CAR nonlinear effects and other nonlinear properties to adjust the filter responses based on light intensity. Okay allowing for tunable frequency selectivity. So, that is very important tunability in any in any kind of devices. So, here the device materials remain same because the material is proportion changing with intensity of the incoming light it behaves differently the same device can give you a different output wavelength. This enhances the device functionality with minimal physical adjustment thus offering applications in dense WDM network or systems like wavelength division multiplexing systems. Then we have seen optical bistability. This can be achieved through setups something like waveguide cavity waveguide kind of filter, but you have to incorporate CAN nonlinearity here in the cavity. So, bistability comes from another nonlinear changes in the optical or you can say dielectric constant. Okay. This leads to significant shift in the resonance frequency within the cavity and this will en enable the system to exhibit two stable states on state and off state depending on the input power and this is very useful for optical switches and different memory devices. So, with that we will we'll conclude here. If you have got any doubt or query regarding this lecture you can always send your queries to this email address mentioning MOOC and the lecture number on the subject line. Thank you.